All your pain has a purpose. There's never a time that he's not working in your life according to his purpose. Never. And I know there are heavy hearts in here this morning. There are folks that are dealing with stuff and you don't know what it's going to look like in the days ahead. Maybe you should think about it this way. I'm staying in Greenville right now in the house I grew up in. And there's about two or three doors there at the house. It's got some holes in it that I put there when I was angry. That my mom and dad would wake me up in the morning, take me down to church, make me put on shoes that hurt my feet. Shirts that was tight. But I want to tell you something. Today I thank God that I had parents like the parents in this room here today that went to church anyway. 
I thank God that I was raised in a house where I could hear the gospel in my home and I could hear it at the church next door. And I want to say something to you. I don't know what it's like at your house. But he's working through it. Trust him. He's made a way. And the effort that you're putting in and the difficulties that you're going through, I believe one day when you get home, you're going to say, look what God did in that mess I made. Amen. See, the master's got a plan. And as hard as it was to get here this morning, I want to tell you something. The gospel's still the power of God to salvation. And no matter how weak the preacher is, the word is strong enough to get through. So if you fought to get here this morning, now it's time to hear why God brought you. We've heard the songs and the truth sung through praise of God. Now let's hear the very preached word of God. Would you stand? Our text for the morning is Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 10. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. And then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I've sinned, betraying innocent blood, they said. What is it to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, Well, it's not lawful to put this money into the treasury since it's blood money. So they took counsel and brought with them the potter, bought with them. The, thought, the potter's field is a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field. As the Lord directed me. May God bless. Would you please be seated? You remember, if you were here last week or you listened online, that uh, this is all really tied to Jesus' prayer time in Gethsemane. You remember he said, Father, how about taking this from me? Boy, do you ever feel that way? whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with. Man, how about taking this away? And then through prayer, he began to say, God, not what I want, but what you want. He submitted to God's will. That's a big key here. It covers this whole scene of going to the cross and the judgment and the governor and the priest, the religious ain't working anymore crowd. He submitted, then he said, let's go. First thing happened, he was arrested. Second thing happened, last week we talked about, they sentenced him to death. These people that have a religion which really doesn't inform their lives or do anything to them, they wanted to kill him, so now they're taking him to the world's authority. And that's what religious people do. As a matter of fact, uh, John Bunyan called it the moral majority. And uh, there was this guy in this town, he was Mr. Morality. He looked good on the outside, didn't have much happening on the inside. And so these folks that looked good on the outside, not much happening on the inside, they, want, they wanted Jesus gone. He was interfering with their religion. And so now you see they're taking him to Pilate. Pilate was a governor. He was sort of the, uh, the maybe the kids would say, the Mac Daddy in this little region in which he was. And he, he discerned things. We're going to talk about him next week. But to this week, I want us to look at Judas. I want us to look at how important it is to finish the race, not just start the race. How important it is that you don't look to man to clean you up, but God alone. And finishing is the point, never starting. 
And I, I want us to look at this man who uh, we call Judas Iscariot. His, uh, one of the disciples uh, of God. You, you, you know the story. There were 12 apostle, apostles or disciples and he was one of them. He, he was really a sort of successful disciple. Now, I don't want you people on the finance committee to take this wrong. But he was the guy that was trusted with the money. Don't you email me and say, preacher, you're talking about me. I'm on the finance. I'm on the finance. I'm not Judas. You're not Judas. I'm talking about Judas. We're talking about a person here. But I will tell you this. If you look at the people in the Bible and you don't see yourself to some degree, you're missing the point. They're not models, they're mirrors. And we need to be able to come to God's Word and hear it in such a way that it impacts our life and our heart because God does that, not preachers. And God brought you here today and He wants to speak to you and encourage you. But man, this guy started off good. He was a highly respected disciple, had charge of the money. He was a one who was respected. He, 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 he started really good. Boy, I love to hear kids talk in a worship service, don't you? Makes me feel good. When I went to seminary in Louisville, I never will forget I was in a spiritual formation class. You know what that is? A spiritual formation class, they're trying to teach you how do you get close to God and it's devotions and uh, we read all kinds of books and, uh, about prayer and about uh, staying in contact with God, living your life in a way that was pleasing to God. But I never will forget this one day the professor said this. He said 75% of the people that start seminary to train to be a man of God, called by God, do not retire from the ministry. Do you know why that is? Because it's one thing to start something. But it's a completely different thing to finish. As a matter of fact, three of my best friends, uh, if you count me, four of us were together. I had good friends. One of them was my friend who lives in Alabama. He's no longer pastoring. He is working for the School of the Blind in the state of Alabama. Great guy. One of my friends is no longer a pastor. He is a, a lawyer in Little Rock, Arkansas. And then my final friend, probably my closest friend, no longer serves the Lord in ministry. He has early onset Alzheimer's. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not saying these people are lost because the only one that can judge if you're saved or lost is who? God himself. (laughs) Thank God for that. But, But I'm just saying starting something... And how you start doesn't really determine anything. It's just, it just means that you got started. As a matter of fact, when you look at Judas' life in the Scriptures, 20 times he's mentioned in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the book of Acts, the, the Acts of the Apostles, which really is our church. In Matthew 10, 4, it says this way, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, comma, who betrayed him, Do you know what Judas is remembered for? He's remembered for his betrayal. He's remembered for this final act in his life. That's what every gospel writer says when they put Judas' name. You know, Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. Man, can you imagine? Man, I think about... uh, I, I better not use my family because I told you they gave me a coffee cup. So I'm not going to use my family. I tell you what, my mom and dad are online. They're not here. I'm going to use them. I never will forget when everybody in Berea, South Carolina said, there's no way that your son's ever going to be anything. And I'd sort of proven that through my life. But I remember when God called me to the ministry. My dad walked around like this right here. And he would go in stores and look for people to stop in the food line or the Ingles and tell them, let me tell you what happened to my boy. My mom would do the same thing. And I'm thankful for that. They were proud of me. But I'll tell you something. Don't you think Judas' mom was proud of her, him? Man, I believe Judas' mama would go down there to the place where they were selling everything in Jerusalem. She said, 
You know, my boy is one of the disciples. He's got the cash. He's running the money. Tell you what, I'm proud of him. And, and I want to tell you something. I, I think being proud of your kids is a good thing. But don't measure now. Wait till they finish. Wait till we get home. Because we don't know what's going to happen between now and then. And Judas' mama didn't know what was going to happen. But I'll tell you something. You can see this in his life. You can see early on that he, that he had a something that wasn't quite right. You remember uh, we did and looked at the, the passage where the lady came and anointed Jesus' feet. And let me say something to you, church. We need to get to a place where we don't measure money ourselves, but we give generously. We can spend it any way we want to spend it for the glory of God. Jesus ain't no chintzy, tight rod. He's generous and good. Watch out. Don't let money get such a great hold on you that, boy, you see everything through its effect and what it is. And now some of you say, well, Pastor, you, you think I ought to just not pay no attention to my finances? That's not what I said. But you ought not pay so much attention to them that it drives the rest of your life. Are you in a, in a restaurant? You ever seen these people? You're in a restaurant? and This happened to me the other day. Um, the waitress comes to the table. She said, one check or two. My friend, he looked away like this. I said, I guess one. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, do finances drive us in such a way that they control our lives? And, 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 you, and you see this in Judas' life. In John chapter 12, it's, an, it's not the one I preached on him, but it's another one. In John chapter 12, it says this. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment that is anointing the feet of Jesus not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? You ever met people like that? Man, they always got a different view of how the money ought to be spent. I tell you, we ought to save it. We ought to save that thing for a rainy day. Listen, if you're serving God, resources ain't going to be your problem. <laughs> and if you'll give generously, he'll give you more and open the windows of heaven for you. But I'm telling you something. Be careful that finances don't control your life. You already begin to see some things about Judas Jesus said this of him at the last supper, one of you is a devil. I want to say something else to you. I love you. I'm not mad at you. I don't want you to leave here guilty. But we ought to let God speak the word to our hearts. Amen. And if something ain't right and it don't bend you toward the master, something ain't right with you, not with me. I'm just telling the truth. See, Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knows your heart and he knows mine. He knows what you did, where you've been, what you're thinking, and what you're doing. He knows it all. Because it's, it's evident here in this text because he said, one of you is a devil. And you know what I feel like? I don't want you to get to heaven and say, you know what? That preacher didn't tell me the truth. I couldn't tell that I wasn't where I needed to be with you, Lord. Because I'm telling you something, this, this relationship with God is the most important thing you'll ever have. I think I do a funeral about every 15 days. I did one yesterday. And people don't want to really know about all the good things you've done. They want to know this one thing. Do you know God? Has he saved you from your sin? Have you been set free? And, and, and that's, what, that's what's important with Judas. They, re, they remember him. He started well. He was, he was respected. He was entrusted. But how did he finish? Or better yet, how will you finish? If today's your last day, are you ready? There's a story told. I used to love to read this guy named Aesop. Now, it's spelled Aesop, but they say Aesop. Aesop. I loved Aesop. And Aesop told this story about this rabbit and this turtle. And they was at the intersection one day, and that rabbit said, Man, I'll wear you out, brother. You want a race? That turtle said, You ain't going to wear me out. I'll tell you that right now. What are we racing to? 
told them what they was racing to. Now, this ain't verbatim. Don't go to your school teacher and say, you know, the preacher told about the rabbit and turtle. It ain't the way you told it. Help me, Lord. But, man, that rabbit took off headed to the finish line. He got so far ahead of that turtle, he said, mm, I'm taking me a nap. Amen, Seth? That brother said, he's going to take a nap in the middle of the day, sit down on his hind legs, fast asleep, snoring the best he could. But that turtle, he never gave up. He never quit coming. He got all the way to that finish line. He did his best. He didn't let anything stop him because he knew that he was in a race. And that what he did mattered. And he ended up winning that race. And I thought, man, that's a great example of how important it is not just to start, but to finish. Man, getting married ain't the main thing. You're supposed to stay that way to death. Do you part? Now, if you've been divorced in here, I'm not talking about divorce. I'm just saying, listen, when you get started with Christ, finish. When you get started with anything, finish. It's much more important than starting. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with what? Endurance. Man, this Christian life ain't just getting baptized. I know people that, hmm? listen, it's about finishing. It's about the finish line. It's about the final thing. It's not about getting started. We place so much emphasis on getting saved, and I think we ought to do that. But I'm telling you something. You can get saved and not finish. It doesn't matter. Judas hung out with the most holy brothers that have ever lived. He hung out with 11 other brothers that were chosen by God. He walked with God for three years. And I'll tell you something, being around religious people or religious organizations will not save you. Y'all must not believe that. You didn't acknowledge it. Verse 2, but look into Jesus, the founder. And, and notice this next word. The perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Listen, I want to tell you something, friend. You start with Jesus. Jesus is with you in the middle. Jesus is with you in the problems. And Jesus is the one in the finish. Amen? Judas didn't get that. Look at his life. Verse 3. That's just what the Bible says. I didn't make this up. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. He changed his mind. Just leave it up there. Boy, how many of us have done something we don't know to do and changed our mind about it? I'm telling you, friend, you can change your mind on every bad thing you've ever done. It don't mean a thing unless you do something with that changed mind. Watch this. He changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned, betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Stop right there. Now, I want to tell you something. You can do something bad. You can steal money. And you can go take it back to the bank. That will not make you right with God. You can do something wrong on the internet, in a relationship with your family, in your relationship at work, and you can go to your pastor, you can sit in his office and say, Pastor, I've done something wrong. That will not change anything. See, if what we do wrong causes us to realize we've done something wrong, that's good, but it don't change anything. I mean, this prophet or priest or whoever responded to him said, what's that got to do with me, what you've done? You take care of that yourself. And I just want to say something to you. I'm talking too loud. Probably scaring the visitors. I'm sorry. I'll be quieter next week. I know you ain't scared climbing, but some of them, I don't want to scare nobody. Listen. God don't want to scare nobody. But if you're hanging on to the wrong thing for your salvation, it ought to scare you to death. 
You ought not be able to leave this church today knowing that you're not where you need to be. And all I'm telling you, Jesus said this way, when the tree's bad, the root's bad. The fruit's bad. He, he, he confessed to the religion it didn't work in crowd anymore. He had taken and went to the high priest and said, how much would you give me to tell you where Jesus is at? You can read that in Matthew 26. In verse 3, he says, I've sinned. The word for this means that, and you've probably heard this. I've heard preachers say this all my life. You miss the mark. And, and it's like when you go to, y'all ever been to them uh, archery tournaments? Man, you know, you start off up close. And in the center, there's these concentric circles that go out. But in the center, man, that's one you, because I think you get scored on hitting the center. Amen. And, and this is a picture that, that you're aiming for the center, but they done moved you from the first station back to the second station. Man, you're having to loop that thing in. A, and you miss it. You miss the mark. You, you, you don't do what is meant to be done in order to win the contest. And that's what he's talking about here. This word, I have sinned. I've missed the mark. I haven't done what I'm supposed to do. I haven't done what's right. I've done what's wrong. He knew that he had sinned. There's no question about that in this text. And I think in today's church, we might think, well, well, he confessed. He confessed. Well, who did he confess to? Well, he confessed to these religious people. I want to tell you something today. If you're going to confess, I think uh, James chapter 5 says, confess to one another your faults. And I think that's good and healthy. But it don't save you and it don't erase the fault. Boy, I tell you what, y'all have never heard this message before. You're scaring me. Let's just go to the end and say a prayer. Uh, <laughs> recognizing sin is not enough. Many know that they should forgive, but forgiving is another thing. Many know that they should pay taxes, but paying taxes is another thing. Many know that lust is wrong, but. Many know that what they say and do is wrong, but. Recognizing is not enough. Giving back the money is not enough. Confessing to a priest is not enough. Now, you say, Philip, what about Zacchaeus? Because I know I got smart people here. Y'all know the Bible. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Luke chapter 19. Look at this. I want to show you the difference between giving the money back and being saved by grace through faith and living your life in a way that's different than it's ever been before. Luke chapter 19. And when Jesus came up to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, these religious people, these people who judge everything by the outside, they said, mm, he has gone to be with the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to your house. Now, we get that mixed up. I'll just leave it up there, please. We get that mixed up. We think, man, Judas gave the money back. Judas gave the money back. Judas felt shame and guilt. He did what he did because he knew what he did was wrong. But in this text, Jesus said, salvation has come to your house. Listen, when God comes to you and touches you, it'll change everything about you. And if it doesn't, somebody might have slipped you something that ain't real. Zacchaeus gave Today, salvation, Jesus is talking. Today, today, salvation has come to this house since he is also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I want to say something about Judas. I don't think for a minute that when God selected him that he didn't know what was going to happen to him. But I think God would die for Judas. I think God would die for you. 
and be risen on the third day for your sin and my sin, for these people that killed him. Let me tell you something about Jesus. He went to that cross because he submitted to the will of his Father that the world might be saved by him. But I'm telling you something. Salvation doesn't mean hanging around religious people. Salvation doesn't mean anything that you've been saved by grace through faith. That your hope is in Jesus Christ. I, I, I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. Mm, I better not. Zacchaeus was saved, and he began to be from, you might think of it this way. I love you. Say amen. Zacchaeus was a cheating, chintzy, stingy brother. But man, when he met Jesus and he got saved, he turned into a generous, giving brother. Now, that's probably not very favorable or in a bad economy, and I probably shouldn't have used that, and forgive me for that, Lord, if that's not right. Verse 5, and throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. Let me tell you something what sin will do to you. Sin and doing wrong will make you feel ashamed. It'll cause you to feel guilty. It'll mess you up so much inside that you'll have to get help from somebody else to deal with the stuff that you're dealing with inside. Sin will fracture your life. It'll stress you out. And I believe that when Judas felt this way, he went to be hanged. And so most people, when they go to a suicide, they think, man, if you commit suicide, you out. You out. You just like Judas. Let me tell you something, friend. I will tell this story. I did a funeral yesterday. And this guy was a marijuana smoker. He smoked marijuana, had a stroke. Now, I didn't tell the people this at the funeral. I'm telling you this as an illustration. Say illustration. He called me about a year ago. He said, Philip, will you do my funeral? I made him give a testimony. I believe he trusted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I believe he loved him for two and a half years. He suffered with stroke and never complained. Other than one time when a, when a squirrel got in his house and he called his wife. He couldn't get out of the bed because he's an invalid. And he said, honey, there's a critter in here. And she came in the first time she saw the cat. She went back in her bedroom. You know how wives are. We love them. But you know how they are. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I remember I used to punch my wife in the back when my kids would cry at 3 o'clock in the morning. She said, honey, there's a critter in here. And he came in there, and there was a squirrel in there with that cat. And that squirrel was on the wall like this right here. And that cat was looking at it. That thing was scared to death. But this guy had so much pain that a lot of time he used that medical marijuana. You know what kind of, uh, it's just a special marijuana. They say it's good. I, I didn't have it when I was out on the street, thank God. But his wife said, you know, he liked that marijuana. He liked it. I said, Kim, I've talked to him about his relationship with God. I believe he believes and he's ready to go home. As a matter of fact, he told the funeral director this. Tell the people that I didn't die, but I've been set free. And what he meant was he laid this old dust-filled body down, and he went into the heavenly places because of what Jesus had done, not what he had done. See, a lot of times we think it's what we've done that saves us or not. And I appreciate some of you. or Man, y'all walk the tight line. I believe y'all going to be in the front line of heaven. I love y'all. I know a lot of y'all a lot better than me. I got that. But I'm going to tell you something. His blood's washed me clean, and he'll wash you clean today. And your hope won't be in what you've done, but what he did on the cross. Amen. Makes a difference. Mahatma Gandhi. I think this is a true story. I got it from the internet. <laughs> I love you. That's funny, wasn't it? That's good. Mahatma Gandhi is fasting to protest the riot killings that followed the partition that created Hindu India and Muslim Pakistan in 1947. So this guy comes up to him and he said, man, I, I just want to be honest with you. I killed a child during this raucous fray that took place. He's telling Gandhi that. Now, I, I like Gandhi. Don't, don't email me. I like Gandhi. I'm just telling you a story. It's a story. It's an illustration. So Gandhi says to him, you killed a boy? He said, yeah. He said, I tell you what, go find a boy that doesn't have any parents and raise that boy up, feed him, school him, give him education, and then 
Let me, let me make sure I got his words right. Find a child, a little boy whose mother and father have been killed and raise him as your own. Only be sure he is a Muslim and that you raise him as one. Now you get what he's saying here, right? He's saying, boy, if you've done something bad, if you'll just pay something back, then that'll clean your scale. It'll even it out just like at the bank when you bounce a check and you go in there and you pay $35 extra. I don't know nothing about it. I've heard this. And they say, we want $35 from this one and this one. Would you pay? That's $95. Would you pay it? Yeah, I'll pay it. Can I keep my checking account open? Yes, you can. And that's the way sometimes we look at sin. I just need to pay it back. I just need to be good. I just need to do something to overcome what I have said, thought, or done. I'm telling you something, friend, that brother will bust hell wide open. If that's the only hope he's got, he's done good in the world that he lives in. The only way you can make it from this world to that world is through the cross that Christ climbed upon and spread out his arms and gave his life and was buried in a tomb. And on the third day, he wasn't there because he had risen. She knows. Woo! Man, I like it. Can y'all come back? Now, listen, I'm not funny with you. Ain't nothing can wash away your sin. No matter how deep it is, you say, Philip, you don't know why. You don't know what I'm going through. I, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm dealing with. I tell you, friend, the answer is the same. The only thing that can wash your sin away is Jesus Christ. Placing your trust. I, Philip Blankenship, believe, Lord, that you paid it all and I'm coming under you. I'm like Zacchaeus, Lord. Salvation has come to my house and God will save you and change you today. But don't you leave this building today without hope that is eternal. You say, well, Philip, I'm embarrassed. I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to. Who cares, friend? If you hear God calling you this morning, you come to him. He'll save you as you trust him as Lord and Savior. And then leave the rest to him. Don't worry about embarrassment. Don't worry about what other people think. That's what Judas worried about. Hey, I've done wrong. Will you help me? Here's the money back. They said this, and I think it's a great gospel text, by the way. He said, you better deal with that yourself. Now, my mom and daddy brought me to church. I told you that at the beginning. And I'm thankful for them, not them. I was kicking doors at the time. But I tell you what, there was one Sunday night that I got to a place in my life, and I said, God's calling me. I was eight years old. I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't know all the facts about the book. I just knew God was calling me, and I was coming. And he touched me and healed me. And I ain't done right since then. My hope is not in me. It's in him. What's your hope in this morning? If today was your last day, and I just want to ask you a personal question, would you come to him this morning? Before us, I think it's Steve Sears that says this, before it's everlasting, too late. And it doesn't matter your age today. If you'll come to him, he'll save you completely. And I'll tell you something else. For some of the rest of you in here, if you're saved, believe it and proclaim it. Praise him because of what he's done. And it ain't dependent upon what you do. Amen? In John chapter 8, he says it this way. Jesus assured them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave of sin. I should ask you to raise your hand, but every hand in this room would go up. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. What's your response to God's word this morning? Will you stand every head bowed and every eye closed? Father, we come to you this morning. And we thank you for who you are today. I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you so much. That when the people said, you said to them, depart from me for I never knew you. And they said, well, we did this and we did this and we did this. I pray there won't be a person here that believes that what they've done is saved 
but they'll believe that what you've done will save them. Today, tomorrow, and forever. Please, Lord, would you work in a way that only you can. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You sing and respond as God leads you. My hope is built on nothing less. Being a part of our worship service today, we pray that you'd experience God's grace or his word. And because we can't see you, but you can see us, we want you to know that we care about you. And there may be a need that you have, a prayer concern. Uh, maybe you want to know more about uh, our Lord and Savior. And we want to be there to help you, to connect with you. So we want to put on the screen a number that you could call. We'd love to be in touch with you and help you in any way we can. Uh, also... Uh, you may have something that you need a pastor for, and we'd like to meet that need for you as well. Call us. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for being with us.